I'd like to talk a little bit about what our measurements are for. Because if we're engineers, we need to know why we're making these measurements and what use they're going to be put to. So there's three categories we can divide things into, roughly. One is we could be measuring because we're trying to discover something. So measurement for discovery. Now, examples of that would be the uh, Sudbury Neutrino uh, Observatory, uh, where we eventually got a Nobel Prize at Queen's, so that's fantastic, for fundamental physics. Or the Large Hadron Collider, again, a well-known big facility. On the other hand, in McLaughlin Hall, you'll also find the Otter Lab, where we're looking at uh, flows over uh, over wings in transient situations uh, relating to takeoff or wind turbines. Again, doing some fundamental measurements where we're trying to discover relationships that we don't understand as well as we might so far. On the other hand, if we're engaged in practical active engineering, we're probably trying to make some products. And if we're going to develop some products, we'll need to engage in measurement for development. We've already discovered the effects that we're interested in. We're now trying to develop our products further to understand that. And I'm going to use some examples taken from the automotive industry, but this applies across all industries. So the kinds of people who might be doing this would be development design engineers at places like GM or BMW or Toyota or any number of other manufacturers. And their objective is to take what we've learned from our fundamental discoveries about uh, mechanical engineering subjects and turn them into practical products that we can then manufacture and sell. And finally, even a little further along the line, we'll have the topic of this course, which is measurement for mechatronics. Now, when we're measuring for mechatronics, we're still looking at the same kinds of products that we developed over here. So the systems that we're developing are still developed by people like GM or BMW or Toyota for automotive systems. But we're now trying to build them into each and every product we sell. So this is figuring out how to build cars. This is figuring out how to operate an individual car. So usually when we're trying to discover something, we're usually looking to detect small effects that are really buried in the larger uh, uh, phenomena that we're examining. Uh, we're, we're trying to detect those small effects that tell us a little bit more about what's going on because usually we're doing incremental work to better understand what's happening. To detect those small effects, we're going to need to take huge amounts of data. And we're going to have to spend quite a long time examining that data, often many years, to get us to a point where we understand something. And we can afford to take many years to do that because we're doing basic science. And this science may be motivated by a, a real application, making it engineering science, but we're still trying to understand the basic physics of what's going on and discover the nature of that, those relationships. And typically, we wind up spending quite a bit of money in developing these relationships because once we learn this stuff, we can take it and apply it to a huge number of different applications. So that actually makes it worthwhile to spend that kind of money, in addition to also gaining a better understanding of the way the world works. If we're doing development, we really want to not necessarily capture the smallest effects that are going on because we're interested in reproducible effects. The really small effects, the, the, the stuff that's difficult to detect, we probably can't make it happen again and again and again if we build thousands of cars. 
So we're more interested in the larger scale activity that we can reproduce in many, many different cars. And we're still going to wind up with a lot of data because we've got to do a lot of testing, but it may not be quite as much data. So we're still looking at large to huge quantities of data. And with these large amounts of data, we're going to have to have fairly substantial computational resources to work on them. And if we're in development, we've got a product that we've got to deliver to market on time, so we don't have many years to understand, but we've probably still got weeks or even months in our product development cycle to improve the design for many different cars. So we've got weeks or months, we're improving design, we're going to apply that design over many different cars, but it is still very much applied science, or let's call it what it really is, engineering. Because we're going to apply this over many, many different cars, we can still afford to spend a fair bit of money on this development because we can recoup that cost of doing this development over many units. So we might spend somewhere between quite a few dollars and many dollars on development measurement because we've got economies of scale. For example, if I'm designing a new engine, a new internal combustion engine to go into a whole line of automobiles, I want to know a lot about the effects of the air-fuel ratio on the exhaust that comes out, on the energy efficiency of the engine, and on our ability to start it. And what I'll discover is that I need a richer mixture with higher emissions in order to do starting, especially at cold temperatures. But then I can lean out that mixture. I can put less and less fuel into it to get more economical and less polluting results as the engine warms up and I go off driving down the road after I start it. So I need to make a fairly detailed map of that performance for that particular engine uh, so that I'll know how to operate it in all of the vehicles I'm going to build that I'm going to put that engine into. Once we've done that, we then get down to the individual car. We've got a mechatronic system in our car. It's making a whole lot of measurements all the time, and it's controlling things like the fuel-air ratio that's going into the engine. And it's controlling it all the time, continuously. It's updating repeatedly, multiple times to, per second, to decide what's happening in the engine and how it should adjust the operating parameters of the engine. So here we're looking for reliable operation. And reliable operation can mean a lot of different things. Certainly the car has to run, it has to start effectively, it has to give us good fuel economy, it has to give us the emissions that we guaranteed and the emissions that match up with the testing protocols because it's important that we be delivering uh, automobiles that are uh, living up to their requirements. So maybe not, maybe not Volkswagens, we're not sure. Then finally, we're going to have a limited amount of data to deal with. And this data is limited because we only know about this particular car and also because we don't have a huge amount of storage space to keep all of that data. So we're going to be mostly interested in a relatively small to medium quantity of data. Data that we can store cost effectively in the car so that it's available right away for us to make use of to know how that car performs and how it has performed for the last little while. We don't have weeks or months to decide how we're going to adjust the, uh, the fuel-air mixture in the car. We've got to adjust that immediately, in real time. So we can't download the data to a computer and analyze it and look at it on our screen and make a decision, which we can in either the de development stage 
and certainly in the discovery stage, we need to have an automated mechatronic system that can make changes to the operations of that engine in real time. We're no longer doing engineering or applied science. We're just doing engine operations. And we're not going to learn anything new necessarily from making this measurement, but we're going to make this engine operate effectively. And because we've got to put this mechatronic system into every single car, it has to be much cheaper than the amount of money that we might spend on a basic science or a development program. In fact, we might want to, for some consumer products, be able to drive that down to costs less than a dollar for our electronics to make the measurement that we need to make in order to make the decision that we need to make. Certainly in consumer products, everything that you've got with a display has got a microcontroller in it, it's got a mechatronic system. We're always trying to drive that cost down. So there's three different approaches to uh, measurement for three different reasons to measure things. One, the focus of this course is measurement for mechatronics. That's MEC 217. And we're concentrating on that because there's a whole lot of challenges in here that are real world engineering applications challenges. There's a whole lot of exciting hardware that allows us to incorporate this kind of mechatronic control into cheaper and cheaper consumer products extending well down the economic scale, down from dollars down towards uh, cents, and huge opportunities here for enhancement of quality of life for all of us through better control of the mechanical systems that we're operating. Most of the things that we'll learn here are equally applicable as we move up the scale and spend more and more money to get more and more accurate and detailed data with more and more information available to make those new discoveries. So if you think you're going on to do discovery level research or even development and, and design work in industry, all of the things that we learn about measurements in mechatronics down here at the actual consumer product scale are going to be extendable back into these uh, other areas where you'd be making measurements.